A confident delivery is not synonymous with accurate information. He doesn't have androgenic alopecia. Misrepresenting data in scientific rebuttals, missummarizing somebody's positions, holding people accountable for views they don't even have. Telogen effluvium is a separate process, which is a lot less common. Hi, this is Rob from Perfect Hair Health, and today we are going to respond to Kevin Mann's video reacting to my interview with Dr. Paul Saladino. Now, Kevin Mann is, I believe, a personal trainer, a sales rep, and a YouTube personality. He runs a channel called Hair Cafe, and it focuses on topics related to hair loss. Let's get right back into fighting the slaphead curse one video at a time. We don't always share the same data interpretation and certainly not the same style of communication, but I appreciate Kevin's efforts to support the hair loss community, and I also think that he works really hard. Recently, Kevin Mann posted a video about my interview with Paul Saladino. It is far from flattering. And while I appreciate the time Kevin spent on this subject, and I'm always an advocate for intelligent debate, I was disappointed to see Kevin Mann use this opportunity for discourse really as a chance to misrepresent me, my opinions, and my interview exchanges. Specifically, Kevin Mann creates a false narrative about my medical history. Why is Rob English even bother trying to save his hair? He doesn't have androgenic alopecia. He hypercuts the interview to criticize me for things I never say. He claims almost everybody has pattern hair loss, and only smart people like he and Paul Saladino have figured out that you can avoid it by reducing stress, killing animals. In his counterpoints, Kevin Mann gets basic hair loss science wrong. Now, telogen effluvium is the second most common cause of hair loss, albeit a distant second, but it is defined as a temporary loss of hair due to extreme stress such as the loss of a loved one or trauma due to surgery or injuries. And then he uses his own misinterpretations of the interview and of the scientific data he cites to justify a series of insults. These two gunks, maybe he has a crush on Paul Saladino or something, more sucking up and shameless simping. Rambling bro science bullshit. Finally, Kevin omits key parts of the interview so that he can falsely allege that I sell a program that only focuses on scalp massages. And they like to give the impression that there are somehow a lot of unknown hair loss treatments out there and that these unproven so-called natural therapies may be better than FDA clinically proven medications. You want to sell programs based around the same premise. In reality, those massage techniques are entirely free. They're published in a dermatology journal and they're just one of many interventions talked about inside of our community. On that note, dozens of our videos actually focus on dispelling myths on finasteride so that people don't inadvertently avoid this drug due to their exposure to bad information or even get stuck trying natural approaches for too long because they don't know much about results horizons. A cursory glance at my podcast with Paul Saladino or even my earliest YouTube videos would have confirmed this. Fortunately, for anybody interested in the facts, we have the full interview, which I'll link below. But for those who want more, we have this video response, because I see this not just as an opportunity to talk about the truth, but also a chance to dive deeper into many of the hair loss topics that, in my opinion, get very little coverage on YouTube. And of course, we'll cover my discussions with investigation groups, my work as a medical editor, and a point-by-point -point response to Kevin's video, which I'm sure some people have been looking forward to. First, I was on Paul Saladino's podcast two months ago to talk about hair loss. The conversation spans over two hours. It's front-loaded with my story, my entry into manuscript writing and hair loss research, the genetic and androgenic basis of androgenic alopecia, clinical data supporting DHT reduction, the safety and efficacy of finasteride, and interaction points between hair loss disorders. Later on, we talk about evidence surrounding a few natural interventions, some of my research interests, and a few anecdotes relating to the microbiome and hair loss. The discussion is filled with data qualifiers to discern data quality. So at any point, people know if we're talking about studies related to cell cultures, animals, anecdotes, or clinical research. That's so that we can discern facts from speculation. Kevin takes this two plus hour conversation, truncates my talking points to 10 minutes, and then comments on these selected cuts of me for over an hour. Nothing personal, I hope. At least now your followers don't have to watch the even longer original podcast video since I did them a favor of taking it basically through a colander and draining out all the bullshit. So you're welcome for that one. Wow. Now, there's a lot of confidence right there. I like that. I like that, Dennis. Now, obviously, there is a place for reaction videos. But cutting 90% of an interview, among other things, runs the risk of omitting some key context, which is fine if you're capable of accurately summarizing someone's views. But that is not what's happening here. 
So I am making this video to share my perspective on Kevin's video and to go through a few places where Kevin Mann presents false information. Also, I know that some of Kevin Mann's subscribers will see this video and immediately dislike it. That's fine. I know how it goes. But on this channel, we foster scientific discussions, not trolling sessions. So please be mindful of any comments directed at me and especially at Kevin Mann. If what you're writing is unintelligible, designed to be hurtful or wildly inaccurate, it's going to get deleted so that we can make room for people who care to have productive conversations. He doesn't have androgenic alopecia. Five minutes into his video, Kevin Mann begins his own investigation into my history with hair loss. Going to his website, perfecthairhealth.com, you read about him. At 17 years of age, he went to a hair transplant doctor with his mother, and the doctor did say he had some hair thinning, though his hairline was intact. Here, Kevin is referring to my hair loss diagnosis from 2007. This was done by a medical professional specializing in hair loss disorders. As we can see, my diagnosis states male pattern baldness, also known as androgenic alopecia. This is corroborated by the fact that I was prescribed one milligram of finasteride. That is the exact drug and dosage approved by the FDA as a treatment for male pattern hair loss. In other words, you're generally only prescribed this drug at this dosage from a hair loss specialist with these words on your diagnosis paper if you've actually been diagnosed with male pattern hair loss. For whatever reason, Kevin decides not to read the part of the diagnosis that says male pattern hair loss. Instead, he selectively reads other portions of the diagnosis, looks at my photos, talks about the geometry of a hair whirl, and then declares, So I think I discovered what Rob English's secret to solving hair loss is. It's not having androgenic alopecia to begin with. This is categorically false, and anybody reading the full diagnosis would recognize this. Moreover, this diagnosis was not the only medical opinion that I sought. It was just the first. I've had numerous hair loss assessments by different medical professionals, all of whom who have diagnosed me with the same exact thing. Androgenic alopecia, also known as male pattern hair loss. In fact, I've actually never received a diagnosis for hair loss other than androgenic alopecia. And while I don't have any issues with Kevin Mann offering his opinion here, his commentary soon shifts to definitive statements and allegations which become a through line in the rest of his video. Why is Rob English even bother trying to save his hair? He doesn't have androgenic alopecia. No, it didn't, Mr. English. You never had hair loss to begin with. How can you cure a condition you don't have? But of course, Rob English isn't a good case study on the matter since we all know he doesn't actually have androgenic alopecia. But remember, he does doesn't have androgenic alopecia. He just likes to talk about it a lot for some reason. Show me sea urchin. <laughs> oh, one strike. Oh, that buzzer sounds its awfully loud. It, it is loud. Pierces yeah. you right down to your soul, doesn't it? I don't like it. Kevin made no effort to contact me prior to posting his video. If he did, I would have happily forwarded him emails between me and these clinics, or the release forms I had to sign, or even the diagnosis itself, or other diagnoses corroborating it. Also, Minutes after alleging that doctors are apparently wrong about my hair loss diagnosis, Kevin Mann, a personal trainer, then goes on to say this. The fact, though, is that doctors do know what they're talking about. Doctors are not stupid. If your cause of hair loss is due to something other than androgenic alopecia, they will be able to properly diagnose that and treat you accordingly. <laughs> Here, Kevin Mann is referring to a part of the podcast where I mention how doctors often have short time windows with patients and how this can limit their diagnostic and educational capacities for patients who are facing hair loss disorders. So here, Rob English brings up the common misconception that doctors are always rushed and they don't have time to really evaluate you thoroughly or properly educate you. Kevin disagrees with me, which is fine. I think that the data suggests that doctors are overworked, they are burnt out, that patient interactions are too short, and that this compromises the quality quality of care, but who cares about that? The bigger picture now is that Kevin is moving his own goalposts. First, he claims that doctors are wrong about my hair loss diagnosis. Then, minutes later, he says that doctors do know what they're talking about, especially when it comes to diagnosing hair loss. Doesn't anyone notice this? I feel like I'm taking crazy pills! In January 2021, Kevin stated that he monetizes his videos, meaning that he collects money from the ads displayed. I don't have any issues with this. Again, my opinion is that Kevin Mann works really hard on his channel, and I think that he deserves compensation. However, I do take issues with videos that are monetized and that knowingly and willfully misrepresent somebody. For example, say, deliberately ignoring text on a hair loss diagnosis to propagate a false narrative about somebody's medical history.
Now I'd like to go point by point through Kevin Mann's video. As we do this, we'll start to notice a trend. Kevin Mann routinely mischaracterizes what I actually say so that he can criticize me for opinions I don't even hold. After misrepresenting my medical diagnosis, Kevin Mann then begins a new false narrative. He alleges I'm making outlandish claims about a hair loss disorder called telogen effluvium and its interaction points with androgenic alopecia. Rob English is claiming that there is a form of telogen effluvium that just happens all the time due to the usual stress of modern day life. This is an extremely outlandish claim. In reality, Kevin Mann is just mis-summarizing what I really say, getting the definition, prevalence, and causes of telogen effluvium wrong, then using his own misunderstandings of basic hair loss science to justify a series of false claims. So let's go step by step through what Kevin Mann says incorrectly and buckle up because there is a lot to cover. Buckle up, baby. Are you kidding me? In this part of the video, Rob English is saying that the incidence of androgenic alopecia has increased incredibly in just the last 10 to 20 years, and he blames it all on the stress of modern life and the Western diet. He says that surveys in China show that the incidence of male pattern baldness has gone from 2.9% to a whopping 60% in just 10 years. These numbers are hard to believe. Here, Kevin is summarizing a part of the podcast where I suggest that the prevalence of androgenic alopecia might be increasing. Kevin Mann questions the data I reference because to him, the numbers feel off. The 2010 number is from a study measuring cosmetic degrees of baldness in China-based students. The other number is from a study on China-based students reporting whether they have hair loss. These aren't perfectly comparable metrics, so Kevin isn't totally wrong to flag this. I could have used better data to illustrate my point. Nonetheless, I do think that the prevalence of androgenic alopecia is increasing and that cosmetic degrees of hair loss are occurring earlier versus previous generations. I'm also open to being totally wrong about this, but it's not like I'm the only one thinking this way. Researchers in westernized countries have argued this since the early 2000s. In fact, investigation groups first started quantifying a rise in hair loss prevalence starting as early as the 1960s. So I still stand by what I said, but I should have found a better way to argue it. Anyway, we need to rewind for a second and revisit another thing that Kevin says. In this part of the video, Rob English is saying that the incidence of androgenic alopecia has increased incredibly in just the last 10 to 20 years, and he blames it all on the stress of modern life and the Western diet. In the podcast, I don't actually blame it all on just stress and Western dieting. I give a much longer list related to the suspected triggers of a hair loss disorder called telogen effluvium. With these types of hair loss disorders, there's some sort of acute stressor, whether that's psychological or physiological stress, a nutrient deficiency, uh, hypothyroidism, gut dysbiosis, heavy metal toxicity, certain medication usages. Those aren't all the causes I mentioned. For now, just know that Kevin Mann's summary is truncating my list to just stress and Western diets. Anyways, he feels that this dramatic change in hair loss incidence is due to stress causing telogen effluvium in people which is shortening the hair growth cycle and that shedding from stress is accelerating androgenic alopecia because the hair is growing back miniaturized. Again, now my list is going from just stress and western diets, which isn't even what I originally said, to just stress. Miss summary number two. Kevin Mann doesn't go too in-depth into my position here, but if you're curious, you can watch the full podcast. For now, all you need to know is that androgenic alopecia's defining characteristic is something called hair follicle miniaturization. And in androgenic alopecia, miniaturization only progresses between hair cycles. In other words, through hair shedding. Some hair cycling is normal, which is why we shed 100 plus hairs daily even in the absence of a hair loss problem. But there's also a type of hair loss whereby hair shedding can accelerate beyond its normal cycling. This is called telogen effluvium, and it's caused by dozens of factors. Stress, micronutrient imbalances, chronic conditions, certain drug usages, the list is massive. And if you face accelerated shedding in areas predisposed to androgenic alopecia, you run the risk of accelerating androgenic alopecia because with more hair shedding, you actually create more opportunities for hair follicle miniaturization. Basically, my point here to Paul Saladino is twofold. First, since telogen effluvium can feed into androgenic alopecia, we should consider targeting our own hair loss by cataloging its causes. We have to address the causes of miniaturization, 
We also have to address the causes of hair shedding. If you start to shed a lot and you're under chronic stress, you've got these nutrient deficiencies, you've got low-grade hypothyroidism, if you only try to target this male pattern hair loss equation by reducing DHT, you're selling yourself short of significant results. Secondly, because bouts of telogen effluvium can unmask androgenic alopecia, Many people experiencing this exact phenomenon will run the risk of confusing hair loss cause and effect, and thereby inadvertently delaying proper treatment. I even give a real life example of this to Paul Saladino. We'll say, yeah, I got this job and I had a full head of hair and three years later I lost it all to stress. And they're presenting perfectly with male pattern hair loss. And that's only partially true because there's actually an intersection point where male pattern hair loss, intelligent effluvium, hair shedding disorders collide. So what really happened is that this person had the predisposition for male pattern hair loss. They already had the ingredients and the androgens necessary to begin that process of hair follicle miniaturization. And stress led to excessive hair shedding, which then fed into the miniaturization process. It accelerated it. Anyway, all of this is about to become very relevant. Now, telogen effluvium is the second most common cause of hair loss, albeit a distant second, but it is defined as a temporary loss of hair due to extreme stress, such as the loss of a loved one or trauma due to surgery or injuries. Rob English is claiming that there is a form of telogen effluvium that just happens all the time due to the usual stress of modern day life. This is an extremely outlandish claim. <laughs> Remember earlier when Kevin Mann twice truncates my list of causes for telogen effluvium? Now he's doing it a third time. My list is now chiseled all the way down to what Kevin Mann describes as modern day stress, which I am guessing is a subset of stress. But let's revisit what he said one more time, because there's an even bigger problem with what Kevin Mann just described, and that's his own definition of telogen effluvium. Now, telogen effluvium is the second most common cause of hair loss, albeit a distant second, but it is defined as a temporary loss of hair due to extreme stress, such as the loss of a loved one or trauma due to surgery or injury. I disagree with Kevin Mann's definition of telogen effluvium, and so do the world's top hair loss researchers. Take Ralph Truob, who wrote a 2016 review on telogen effluvium and defined the condition as any pathologically increased shedding of normal telogen hairs of greater than 20%. Truob also described telogen effluvium as, by far, the commonest cause of hair loss. In other words, not a distant second to androgenic alopecia, as Kevin so definitively states. And that's utterly ridiculous. I mean, how is dragon an answer and sea urchin isn't? In fact, to give you an idea of just how common telogen effluvium actually is, most humans undergo a small bout of telogen effluvium every single year. It's called seasonal telogen effluvium, also known as seasonal hair shedding. It occurs because of shifts in our circadian rhythms and our exposure to UVB radiation, which for people in the Northern Hemisphere often triggers a bout of shedding every July and August. Truob has studied this, other researchers have studied this, and yes, it is diagnostically telogen effluvium. But again, none of this really matters because at the outset, Kevin Mann doesn't define telogen effluvium correctly, and he doesn't even properly summarize my list of contributors that I tell to Paul Saladino. I actually think Kevin Mann is confusing diagnostic rates of telogen effluvium with prevalence rates. We'll get into that in a second. For now, let's revisit the causes that Kevin attributes to telogen effluvium. Due to extreme stress, such as the loss of a loved one or trauma due to surgery or injuries. According to Ralph Truob and other hair loss investigators, Kevin Mann's list of causes here is incredibly short-sighted. As Truob states in his literature review, telogen effluvium is a pathologically increased shedding of normal telogen hairs of greater than 20%. And in his paper, he lists five subtypes of telogen effluvium, with each subtype corresponding to a unique set of causes. As we can see here, the list is extensive, and it's far closer to the original list that I say to Paul Saladino. On that note, telogen effluvium actually occurs on a gradient, and its magnitude depends on the number of causes present, as well as the severity of each cause. For instance, people with terrible, prolonged vitamin D deficiencies can experience telogen effluvium sheds of 50% or greater, whereas minor vitamin D deficiencies, they only might confer slight upticks to shedding that may qualify as telogen effluvium, but are less cosmetic and thereby a lot easier to miss. In fact, 
Kevin's own narrow definition and incomplete list of causes for telogen effluvium, it really just captures this hair loss disorder's most extreme cases, whereby shedding ratios can hit 60, 70, 80%. These causes are relatively rare, so I can see why Kevin ended up thinking this. But the bottom line is that Kevin Mann is now getting the definition, the prevalence, and the causes of telogen effluvium wrong. And he's using his own misunderstandings to build a false narrative that the argument that I'm presenting to Paul Saladino is outlandish. It isn't. And the only way Kevin Mann arrives to this conclusion is actually by getting basic hair loss science wrong. Now, in Kevin's defense, Ralph Trueb is not a personal trainer. He's only one of the world's top hair loss specialists, and according to Kevin, doctors like him, they're not even capable of diagnosing my own hair loss correctly. Oh, wait a second. The fact, though, is that doctors do know what they're talking about. Okay, got it. Rob English is claiming that there is a form of telogen effluvium that just happens all the time due to the usual stress of modern day life. This is an extremely outlandish claim. This isn't even close to what I suggest in the podcast. Again, modern day stress is not synonymous with the list of causes that I tell to Paul Saladino. We've already covered this. So, let's see what Kevin Mann thinks must be true in order to verify his own missummaries of my position. If we wanted to verify something like this, we'd have to see statistics that show the rate of hair loss in Amazon warehouse employees, for instance, who work under extremely stressful circumstances compared to, say, employees who work at Google who are reportedly pretty pampered. We actually do have data corroborating this. A four-year study on 13,000 men in South Korea found that after adjusting for age, marital status, education, monthly household income, smoking, and work schedule, Men working more than 52 hours per week were significantly more likely to be filling prescriptions for oral medications for hair loss, also known as finasteride, than men working less than 40 hours per week. In fact, this study is even more specific than what Kevin Mann is calling for because it controls for those discrepancies that you would see between Amazon warehouse workers and Google employees. Not to beat a dead horse here, but the evidence very strongly suggests that telogen effluvium does accelerate androgenic alopecia. This is referred to as telogen effluvium unmasking androgenic alopecia. I'm not kidding when I say that dozens of research groups have written about this. These hair loss disorders are separate phenomena, but they very likely do intersect with one another. In fact, let's back up a second. Rob English is claiming that there is a form of telogen effluvium that just happens all the time due to the usual stress of modern day life. As a fun thought experiment, let's falsely presume that I did say this, and then let's disingenuously hold ourselves to the narrow definition of telogen effluvium that Kevin believes in. Even with these parameters, is this really an outlandish claim? I'm seeing a lot of hair loss that's called telogen effluvium, a type of hair loss called telogen effluvium and that is usually related to a physical or emotional stressor. And so these days, even if people haven't had COVID or haven't had big new medical diagnoses, even just the stress of the changes in our day-to-day -day lives has been enough to really create this increase in this telogen effluvium type of hair loss. Apparently, not to Dr. Bottomer, a board-certified dermatologist and professor of dermatology at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Rob, this is only an anecdote, and one from a university professor, dermatologist, frontline worker, practicing medicine and treating real patients suffering from all different types of alopecias. Do you have any real resources to cite? Like videos of personal trainers shouting from library dens? Great question. There are studies corroborating that the effects of lockdowns have led to big spikes in telogen effluvium diagnoses, even in people untouched by the virus. In America, these spikes are centered in populations more susceptible to vitamin D deficiencies, another trigger of telogen effluvium, which can happen when people start spending more time indoors. Again, causes can compound with each other. Also, keep in mind that people generally will only notice and seek medical attention if a telogen effluvium shed hits that 40%, 50%, 60% level. So these increased diagnoses of telogen effluvium, they're really just canaries in the coal mine. They imply that a lot more shedding is occurring further down this gradient. Telogen effluvium is a separate process, which is a lot less common 
The rare causes of hair loss he's talking about, like stress, hypothyroidism, and malnutrition, account for a very small number of hair loss cases, and they are easily distinguishable from male pattern baldness. Doctors are not stupid. I agree that most doctors are not stupid. On that note, Kevin's definition, prevalence, and list of causes for telogen effluvium are at odds with doctors and the world's top hair loss researchers. <coughs> All right, don't you start making that noise. But, all right, it's not funny when they do it. Oh. Oh, God damn it. As is his opinion that telogen effluvium is always easy to distinguish from male and female pattern hair loss. Ralph Trueb has written about how hard it is to distinguish early stage androgenic alopecia from telogen effluvium, and how often these cases can often overlap with one another. Other literature reviews have speculated as to just how common it is for people to face both hair loss disorders simultaneously. In fact, my team and I had the chance to dive into this subject more with Dr. Hugh Rushman, another big figure in hair loss research, because his work suggests that the loss of hair volume in early androgenic alopecia might actually be more so the result of an increase in something called chenogenic hairs than it is for miniaturization, and this seems to be especially true for women. Again, this is why multiple perspectives for education are important. Yes, some of Kevin Mann's videos are great, but as a medical editor, I get to interface with investigators regularly, so I know the importance of avoiding absolutist commentary on any research subject. At this point, you might be wondering, why spend so much time on this telogen effluvium mishap? Well, there are two reasons. First, Kevin Mann's errors here actually snowball into larger allegations later in his reaction video. And second, and what is perhaps most disappointing, is this. Kevin Mann is actually using the same false definition of telogen effluvium that nutritional companies use in clinical trials to bias their selection of participants so they can pick people most likely to experience hair regrowth from a multivitamin. In these trials, researchers will deliberately exclude patients with telogen effluvium on the basis of the same narrowed, incorrect, incomplete definition used by Kevin Mann. Massive hair shedding due to severe stress or extreme trauma. Then, they'll find a bunch of patients who actually do have telogen effluvium, albeit in less severe forms and from causes linked to chronic stress, dietary problems, nutritional imbalances, the things that I already mentioned, because they know that taking a multivitamin will help to correct for some of these imbalances, and in many cases, improve hair counts. Then, these companies get to claim that their product is clinically effective at regrowing hair. They'll advertise that study to androgenic alopecia sufferers who often lack the education to understand that these results won't apply to them because their hair loss causes are androgenic and genetic in nature. This is why so many people fighting androgenic alopecia end up buying products because of studies showing that something like vitamin B12 or vitamin C or vitamin D, omega fatty acids, or even a nutraceutical regrows hair. This is, ironically, the same conflation of cause and effect that I explained to Paul Saladino. But again, Kevin cuts this part out. In the next part of the video, Kevin Mann falsely claims that I'm insinuating people go bald because it's their own fault. And he says that I'm telling people that they can avoid hair loss by changing their lifestyle. Frankly, it's insulting because he's implying that people with male pattern baldness have it because it's their own fault. Only smart people like he and Paul Saladino have figured out that you can avoid it by reducing stress, killing animals. Like earlier, Kevin Mann builds this false narrative by misconstruing my words, getting basic hair loss science wrong, and by cutting out interview segments that actually refute his narrative. So let's walk through Kevin's allegations and show where they differ from the real conversation. So everybody's got the ingredients for pattern hair loss more or less, but not everybody lives in such a way that's going to accelerate its onset. He's now claiming that bad diet decisions as well as bad environment can cause hair shedding and that's what triggers androgenic alopecia. That's not really what I said, but let's keep going. He even goes so far as to say that everyone has the potential to have pattern hair loss, which is androgenic alopecia. The prevalence of cosmetic degrees of androgenic alopecia rises roughly 10% per decade. Some studies have actually shown an incidence of 100% for people who simply live long enough. And that's just cases of pattern hair loss that have reached levels of cosmetic perceptibility. In our team's interviews with dermatologists, virtually all of them stated that 100% of their postpubertal patients showed some degree of hair diameter diversity, which acts as a qualifier for subclinical androgenic alopecia when that diversity is lower than 20%. We even published a paper touching on this subject and the implications it might have for non-balding control groups in AGA histological studies. 
the one thing he doesn't mention in his list of causative factors is the one thing that really does matter, and that is genetics. Remember when I said Kevin Mann truncates two plus hours of my talking points into 10 minutes? And genetics do play a role in the rate of miniaturization per cycle. It's chronic, progressive, and it can affect both men and women. It's androgenic or hormone related, and there's a genetic predisposition behind it. You have this normal hair cycle of growth, of rest, and then of shedding. And at any point in time, 85% of our hairs are growing, a few percentage of them are in resting, and then there's uh, 10 to 15% that are shedding. There you go. I do mention genetics. I do mention that the hair cycle is natural, that shedding is inevitable, and that pattern hair loss will often progress regardless of whether we have a perfect diet or lifestyle. And then... Thought we were done with the buzzer. Oh, only if you repeat an answer. Now, even you, in this round? Yes, even in this round. In fact, nowhere in this podcast did I deny the role of genes and androgens in androgenic alopecia, hair follicle miniaturization, or even accelerated hair cycling. All that I'm suggesting here is that telogen effluvium can compound with these problems. Rob Eglish is saying this like he's the first person to try to say something like this, but he's not. This is a common misconception that hair loss is intrinsically linked to lifestyle, and frankly, it's insulting because he's implying that people with male pattern baldness have it because it's their own fault due to their lifestyle decisions. It's unfair enough that we have to deal with this damn curse, and the last thing hair loss sufferers need is for people to think we're going bald because we make poor lifestyle decisions. Here we are. All of Kevin Mann's missummaries, truncations of what I really said, false definitions of hair loss disorders, and now the flipping of my word choices, such as taking the word accelerate and replacing it with the word cause. So everybody's got the ingredients for pattern hair loss, more or less, but not everybody lives in such a way that's going to accelerate its onset. And we've made it to the latest allegation. Yes, that is insulting, but no, I never said this. I never implied to Paul Saladino that people go bald because it's their own fault due to their lifestyle decisions. This allegation, unfortunately, becomes another tagline in Kevin Mann's video, but it just isn't accurate. So again, he claims almost everybody has pattern hair loss and only smart people like he and Paul Saladino have figured out that you can avoid it by reducing stress, killing animals, it's statements like this that give me the impression Kevin Mann is prioritizing entertainment over an honest scientific discussion. I know I'm repeating myself here, but it's also a repeated allegation by Kevin. So no, I never said that you can avoid hair loss by reducing stress or slaughtering animals. We'll just move on to the next question. Okay. All right. Are yes. you ready? Yes. 30 seconds on the clock. <sighs> We're halfway through. So far, it appears Kevin Mann is not accurately portraying me my interview, or my positions. So let's take a quick break from analyzing Kevin Mann's video and address something else that I think is really important. At its core, this is the problem with reaction videos. A video's accuracy is entirely dependent on the integrity of its creator. And the truth is, I could pick any one of Kevin Mann's videos and show you examples of where he gets things wrong or even contradicts himself. And the biggest point of irony is, I wouldn't even need to misrepresent him. Because Kevin Mann routinely makes statements that undermine his own credibility as a science communicator, as an investigative journalist, and even as a historian of his real personal experience with hair loss drugs like finasteride. Take his own story about how he finally worked up the courage to try oral finasteride. So I said, what the hell, I'll try oral finasteride, and I was prescribed uh, Proscar, which is the five milligram tablet for finasteride. I cut it into four, so it's 1.25 milligrams a day. I started every other day, didn't get any side effects, and then I started using it every day, 1.25 milligrams, and I've had no issues with uh, finasteride ever since. I've had no side effects whatsoever, and I was just thinking, am I just an anomaly? I mean, I hear so many people freaking out about finasteride. Here, Kevin Mann says he never experienced any problems trying finasteride. Yet here is a 2013 post from Kevin Mann stating that he cannot use finasteride because he experiences sexual side effects. Or take this clip of Kevin Mann explaining why he thinks that dutasteride is more powerful than finasteride at fighting androgenic alopecia. 
In fact, there was a meta-analysis out of China from last year that showed in three studies involving 576 patients that dutasteride was more effective than finasteride with similar adverse effects over 24 weeks. This improved efficacy is often erroneously attributed to the fact that dutasteride suppresses the type 2 and type 1 5A reductase enzyme, when in reality it's probably just because dutasteride suppresses more of the type 2 enzyme compared to finasteride since the type 2 enzyme is what is active on the scalp. It is a confidently delivered statement by Kevin, but it's one that's not necessarily accurate. Studies from the same meta-analysis that Kevin Mann just cited show that daily dosages of 0.1 milligrams of dutasteride lower scalp DHT by 32%, whereas 5 milligrams of finasteride lower scalp DHT by 41%. But over six months, 0.1 milligrams of dutasteride led to the same hair count improvements as 5 milligrams of finasteride, even though 0.1 milligrams of dutasteride had a directionally less impressive effect on scalp DHT. Since dutasteride inhibits both the type 1 and type 2 5-alpha reductase enzyme, and finasteride only inhibits the type 2 isoform, that means a portion of this 32% DHT reduction is actually coming from type 1 5-alpha reductase inhibition, which, contrary to what Kevin Mann states, is actually found in human hair follicles. That was terrible. I mean, we're bombing out there. This, this is exactly what I was trying to avoid, guys. These findings implicate the type 1 isoform in androgenic alopecia, not necessarily by itself, but in its interactions with the type 2 isoform, as earlier studies hadn't shown hair-related benefits from those using drugs that only targeted type 1 5-alpha reductase. So, Kevin Mann's claims here don't necessarily align with the evolving research or even the meta-analysis that he's using to justify his point. There are also more incendiary cases, like in Kevin Mann's review of Adagen, where he insinuates that the company's founder, John Goss, doesn't even have the baldness gene. This guy does not care about you. He probably doesn't even have the male pattern baldness gene, but he does know men who are losing their hair and don't know any better may be desperate enough to give him their money, and he preys on people like that selling his bullshit products, and for that, that makes him a completely dickless snake oil salesman as well as a grade-A douchebag. <laughs> And yet a cursory glance at Adagen's website or its own YouTube channel shows that John Goss does present with male pattern hair loss very clearly. He even talks openly about receiving a hair transplant. My point here is that a confident delivery is not synonymous with accurate information. Kevin Mann doesn't always get things right, and for the most part that's fine because nobody is going to get everything right. That's why it's so important to vary our sources of information, and also to never get too tribalistic or absolutist about any one ideology. But in this sense, intentions do matter. It's one thing to get things wrong by accident. It's another thing to get things wrong because you have an agenda like trying to make somebody look outlandish or trying to convince a group of people that someone was never diagnosed with androgenic alopecia. And as we'll continue to see, the little things that Kevin Mann gets wrong, deliberately or otherwise, culminate into big allegations that happen to be completely inaccurate. Knowing this, let's dive back into Kevin's video. But before we get there, let's backfill some key context. In the next part of the podcast, Paul Saladino asks me about hair loss interventions outside of the drug model, and specifically ones that I use to see hair improvements. Tell us what you did. Talk to us about these natural therapies for men and for women. What did you do? How did you improve your hair? Now, before I go on, it's important to contextualize that this part of the conversation is beginning 55 minutes into the podcast. Prior to getting here, a part of the discussion covered these interaction points between hair loss disorders, but the majority centered on my story, the evidence supporting the androgenic and genetic basis of androgenic alopecia, and importantly, the efficacy and safety data supporting the drug finasteride. Rob English was starting to make enough sense about finasteride here that I was worried I'd end up agreeing with him on everything and have to stop this video prematurely. Anyway, I tell Paul Saladino about my diagnosis and the anecdotes I'd read online back in 2007, the ones that scared me away from starting finasteride in the first place. I also explained to Paul Saladino that these anecdotes actually run counter to the clinical data that's published on the drug. Studies conducted on thousands of men demonstrating an 80 to 90 percent response rate and a very favorable safety profile. We have a thousand people in the treatment group. We have a thousand people in the placebo group. The risk of side effects for finasteride in the treatment group 1.8% reported for men ages 18 to 41, so people who should be pretty active, pretty virile. No mentions at all of changes to musculature. But then in the 
control group, you see an incidence of 1.3% for sexual side effects. So you get this 0.5 percentage point difference amongst these really well-controlled, double-blinded, placebo-controlled studies demonstrating that this drug, it probably isn't as dangerous or as bad as most people cite. I also discussed the psychosomatic influence of finasteride side effects, like studies demonstrating a five-fold increase in side effects simply resulting from providers telling their patients that the drug might lower libido. I also talk about the cognitive dissonance of some people who seem to have no issues reducing DHT by taking megadose concentrations of food-derived 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, things like astaxanthin or saw palmetto, maybe even reishi mushroom extract, but who won't try synthetic 5-alpha reductase inhibitors like finasteride that actually have much better data surrounding them. A lot of people who are taking these supplements, they have no idea that they're also reducing that enzymatic activity to lower DHT, and yet they're very fearful of trying finasteride because they don't want to reduce that enzymatic activity to lower DHT. Finally, I even make this statement, which Kevin Mann does not feature in his video. Now, if I knew then what I knew today, I probably would have just started taking finasteride, experienced zero changes to athletic performance, no side effects, seen pretty solid hair regrowth, and I probably have a different career right now. Personally, I cannot think of a more glowing endorsement. So keep in mind all of this context. I think that that affords me the green light at this point to start talking about alternative options, especially when those options come attached with data qualifiers for quality, which I do throughout the podcast. What did you do? How did you improve your hair? So I tell him about my experience, as well as the evidence surrounding stimulation-based interventions like microneedling and scalp massaging. In this respect, I start to cite my own peer-reviewed papers. Again, this is 55 minutes into the podcast after a long discussion on how finasteride works, how well it works, and why its side effect profile is likely mischaracterized online. I talk about data we published on standardized scalp massages. I also contextualize our study by discerning the quality of evidence. We've published a, a peer-reviewed study in a dermatology journal about these massage techniques. It was survey-based, so it's not the highest quality, but it is something. I also explain some of the mechanistic overlaps suspected from scalp massages and therapies such as platelet-rich plasma or microneedling specifically acute inflammation generation. In that elicitation of inflammation, you send signaling proteins that not only help to reduce scar tissue long-term, or at least attenuate and, and partially reverse that scar tissue, but you also initiate antigen signalings that improve hair counts over time. This is where Kevin starts to voice a different point of view. In fact, he criticizes my positions on microneedling by first misconstruing the science on wound healing, then alleging the data I'm citing doesn't even exist. For the record, it does. So sort of as an aside, he brings up microneedling as a hair loss treatment, and he says it works by causing inflammation, which supposedly improves hair growth through the promotion of growth factors. But we know inflammation is a process that leads to fibrosis. <laughs> Kevin is right that inflammation is a process that can lead to fibrosis, but this relationship is biphasic, it's dose dependent. With smaller wounds, like those from microneedling, punctures often barely penetrate beyond the epidermis. And in these cases, wounds can actually do the opposite. They can elicit growth factors to help promote angiogenesis and remodel skin that is already scarred. This is why human studies show that microneedling can reduce fibrosis. It's little misunderstandings like this that define most of Kevin Mann's video. Control groups for studies measuring microneedling plus minoxidil, whereby they just have a microneedling group, they also see increases to hair counts. In the studies he quotes looks at microneedling plus minoxidil rather than just microneedling alone. I actually am citing studies that tested microneedling alone. There's also a split scalp study showing that microneedling by itself was as effective as PRP in improving hair counts and potentially even better at improving hair diameters. Kevin Mann never asked for my references, but if he had, I would have been happy to share these studies with him or even show him how I approach conducting a literature review. Listen, I know I gave some bad answers before yeah. and uh, that does not represent me. I'm ready to give good answers. I like that. That I does like that. represent All right, that's Ah, crap, I knew it. We're getting into the whole tight scalp thing again with the Gallia and Apa Neurotica supposedly limiting blood flow by causing scalp tension, blah, 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 blah. Next, 
I talk about the studies on intramuscular botulinum toxin injections into the scalp perimeters of men with androgenic alopecia. Botox is a neuromodifier that's used to relax muscles. And interestingly, Botox injections into the scalp perimeter muscles for men with AGA have demonstrated a response rate of roughly 75 to 80% and an increase in hair counts of roughly 20% with consistent results expressed across four different investigation groups. I describe the hypotheses presented by each of these investigation groups, that Botox helps to relax our scalp perimeter muscles and in doing so might unclamp arterial branches that indirectly supply blood and oxygen to balding hair follicle sites, which might help to lower DHT. So this is totally hypothetical. This is totally, you know, mechanistic and there's no studies to support this, but Technically speaking, DHT is a conversion from testosterone that does not require oxygen whatsoever. I also suggest that taking these muscles out of chronic contraction might be another way by which scalp massages could promote hair growth. But again, this entire discussion is contextualized with disclaimers on data quality, speculation, and mechanistic versus clinical interventional data. Here is how Kevin Mann reacts. Ah, crap, I knew it. We're getting into the whole tight scalp thing again with the Gallia and Upper Neurotica supposedly limiting blood flow by causing scalp tension, blah, 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 blah. This is really disappointing because I thought my previous videos on the subject laid this stupid theory to rest. I mean, even HairGuard hasn't created any new videos defending the blood flow theory, especially after I absolutely mogged the bleeding crap out of his worthless grow band. But somehow this stupid theory refuses to die. And yes, I do blame you for this, Rob English. So please, dude, stop. Stop trying to make the blood flow theory a serious subject. It is, always has been, and always will be a scam marketing gimmick to sell worthless products and programs. All right. For those who don't know, HairGuard is a company that sells a hair loss product called the Grow Band. They describe it as a scalp tension relaxer. The Grow Band is similar, if not identical, to a knockoff device sold out of Japan in the 1990s, the Takeda Medex Scalp Tension Relaxer. This product was clinically studied and it did show some benefit in improving androgenic alopecia, albeit at usage intervals of two plus hours daily, which is just too much time for people. In their advertisements, HairGuard often cites some of my peer-reviewed papers as support for why their products might work. I just wanna be clear here, I cannot help if HairGuard takes my open access peer reviewed papers and then co-ops my research to sell people hair loss products that I don't believe in. For what it's worth, we've reviewed HairGuard's Grow Band and their essential supplement inside of our membership. They're not favorable reviews. In any case, just as I don't hold George Cotzarellis or Luis Garza responsible for the spike in castor oil sales after they published research on prostaglandins and hair loss, please don't do the same with me, HairGuard, and their sales of the Grow Band. Also, as I mentioned in the podcast, when we published our scalp massage study, we paid additional fees to make that research open access so that nobody has to pay anything to actually read its contents. We publish papers as open access. In fact, we have a demonstration video and PDF instruction on how to do the massages that was a part of that peer reviewed paper. So you don't have a, to face a paywall to get this type of information. That means that the massage PDF instruction and the video demonstration are actually 100% free. Next, Kevin Mann alleges I'm misrepresenting studies on Botox to try and sell programs built around what he calls the blood flow theory. You want to sell programs based around the same premise. Botox data is not the supposed proof of the scalp tension theory that everyone, including Rob English, thinks and wishes it were. Kevin Mann actually reaches these conclusions by confusing studies on intradermal versus intramuscular botulinum toxin injections. He also omits key parts of the interview that refute his narrative and then makes false presumptions about the content inside our community. So let's go through this step by step. In the podcast, I reiterate the hypothesis presented by the investigators across the four intramuscular Botox studies, that Botox injections into these scalp perimeter muscles might unclamp pinched arterial branches that indirectly supply blood to the top of the scalp. And since the conversion of free testosterone into estradiol is oxygen dependent, then increasing blood and thereby oxygen supply might even help to lower DHT. I also suggest that the relaxation of these scalp perimeter muscles might help reduce tension-mediated inflammation across the scalp, 
which might also contribute to the balding process. Kevin Mann has a different take on the Botox data. The bottom line with Botox though, is that there is some evidence that Botox may have a mild effect on hair growth, but not through relaxing muscles. Rather, what causes it is through the decreasing of negative growth factors like TGF beta one. So this Botox data is not the supposed proof of the scalp tension theory that everyone, including Rob English, thinks and wishes it were. Kevin Mann is sort of right, but he's actually not referring to the four studies testing intramuscular injections of Botox. Rather, he's referring to a study that injected Botox intradermally directly into balding regions. This study also did a cell culture test and showed that when hair follicle dermal papillae cells were bathed in Botox, their expression of TGF beta one decreased, whereas DHT increased DGF beta one. This is a signaling protein that can act as a negative regulator for our hair cycle. And since the clinical portion of this one intradermal study demonstrated a 5% increase in hair counts, the researchers suggested that Botox might improve androgenic alopecia by decreasing TGF beta one. I totally understand Kevin's position here, but this one intradermal study is not comparable to the four intramuscular studies on Botox, and for several reasons. First, these intramuscular Botox injections are done several inches away from balding regions, further down the scalp. For Kevin Mann's position to be true, Botox injected into these muscle groups would need to travel out of those muscles into the capillary networks, and then those capillary networks would need to transport the Botox all the way to the top of the scalp, where the toxin would begin to start decreasing TGF beta one levels, and then hopefully have a positive effect on our hair. Let's evaluate the likelihood of this happening. First, studies on botulinum toxins show that Botox typically spreads at most 30 to 45 millimeters from its injection site. At the far end, that's a little over 1.7 inches in all directions from wherever that needle enters. In the intramuscular studies on Botox, for example, in Dr. Frun's original study, hair count assessments were done near the crown with researchers tattooing a freckle close to the hair whorl to use as a reference point for the phototrichograms. I know this because I had a chance to interview Dr. Frund about his research a few years ago. Well, we tried to follow the Kaufman protocols, which were the, uh, the first uh, protocols used in getting finasteride approved. Essentially, uh, pick an area of scalp, you shave it, and you're looking at anywhere from one centimeter to one inch, depending on the study that you're looking at. And then you have to mark that centimeter. So we did it with a, uh, a tattoo using just brown tattoo ink. You make a little tattoo, it looks like a freckle, and you can always go back to that spot. Now, if we use the average size of an adult male head to estimate the difference between the occipital muscles and the crown, this places that tattooed freckle more than six inches away from the closest intramuscular Botox injection site. That means that for Botox to reach the location where Dr front and his colleague estimated hair counts, this Botox would have had to travel three and a half times further than its typically estimated maximum spread. This to me feels highly implausible. Now, there are cases, albeit rare, whereby Botox can escape its injection site and travel into adjacent tissues. This is not supposed to happen, but it has been demonstrated in some rabbit models whereby Botox has escaped muscle and entered adjacent fascia. However, these circumstances are very specific. What I mean is that injection volume for Botox is influenced by at least two factors. First, the dosage of Botox inside each vial, and then second, the volume of its carrier liquid. The only time we really see Botox escape these 30 to 45 millimeter regions is when a practitioner injects low dosage Botox with high volume carrier, which essentially just ruptures tissues and vascular networks, thereby creating an opportunity for the toxin to travel. It's the equivalent of overfilling a balloon. Again, this is an unusual circumstance. It's not standard of care. And methodologies like this, they're not specified in any of these intramuscular botulinum toxin studies. Resultantly, rupture and tissue escape in these studies, in my eyes, way less likely. So in my opinion, it's unlikely that these intramuscular injections are traveling very far at all. And even if the Botox were escaping the tissue, when we account for Botox's therapeutic index of 15 to one and the dense vascularity of the scalp, then by the time that Botox would reach hair count measurement points like the crown, it would have become so diluted that it'd be unlikely to lower TGF beta one in the same capacity as shown in that intradermal study, especially when you account for the fact that Dr. Frun's study injected Botox once every five months and the intradermal studies injected them once every four weeks. Again, 
All signs in my eyes point to a different mechanism for these intramuscular injections, one that potentially involves the muscles themselves. Finally, if Kevin is going to make an apples to oranges comparison between intradermal and intramuscular studies on Botox, I will too. All of the intramuscular studies netted hair counts that were basically 400% higher than that one intradermal study. 18 to 21% versus 5%. That is a big difference, and one that becomes harder to rationalize through equivalent mechanisms after factoring in what I just discussed. In any case, Kevin does make a fair point about researchers not yet knowing the exact mechanisms by which Botox intramuscularly can improve hair counts. It's true, we just don't know. After all, if blood flow were the reason Botox promoted hair growth, then why wouldn't other things that improve blood flow promote it, such as blood pressure medication or cardiovascular exercise? Because vascular networks constricted by physical impediments, such as muscular contractions, would not respond to a vasodilator or exercise. They might, however, respond to a muscle relaxant. I mean, why is it that you think that Botox's mechanism of action is more likely to be because it relaxes the muscles rather than its suppression of negative growth factors, which has been documented and verified in scientific research? Because the other effect of botulinum toxin injected into muscles is muscle relaxation, and the intradermal study is not comparable to the intramuscular study. I already discussed all of this in my previous video on the subject, which I'll link below. Kevin is referring to a video he made about these studies on Botox. I'll also link it below in case anybody wants to see it. I thought some of his points were great and aligned with some of the concerns my team and I raised during our recent literature review on Botox for androgenic alopecia. At the same time, I disagreed with many of Kevin's perspectives shared in his video. A viewer of both our channels left me a comment about Kevin's video. I replied politely with my perspective. So if you're interested in this, here are the screenshots of my comment and you can just read them by pausing this video. Anyway. But I think the real reason you want to downplay, downplay the significance of TGF beta 1 and instead fixate on this whole blood flow thing and scalp tension muscle relaxation thing is because you want to sell programs based around the same premise. No, the real reason is because the studies are incomparable. Intradermal injections are not the same as intramuscular injections. And again, all of the research that we've published on scalp massages is entirely free. You don't need to pay anything to access the video or PDF we showed to participants in that study. The links are even below. Stop giving them false hope by pretending that there is some sort of natural alternative to finasteride. There simply isn't. This is why the context of when this discussion happens is so important. It's after a huge conversation about the clinical data supporting the efficacy and safety of finasteride and a strong endorsement from me. Also, I don't understand why Kevin Mann wants to make this topic so polarizing. It's entirely possible for reduced blood flow to not be the fundamental problem in androgenic alopecia, while simultaneously the clamping of these scalp perimeter muscles to act as an accelerator of androgenic alopecia. These ideas are not contradictory. They're not mutually exclusive. Both dynamics can exist simultaneously, as I mentioned in our video on low blood flow and hair loss, which I know Kevin has seen. They also don't contradict the hypotheses brought forth by Orentrike about donor dominance. Again, the contraction of scalp perimeter muscles might act as a significant accelerator of pattern hair loss for 75 to 80 percent of men, as the Botox data imply, and yet still leave room for androgenic alopecia to occur in its complete absence. Just as there is a massive spectrum of severity for telogen effluvium, there is probably a similar spectrum for those involving the scalp perimeter muscles depending on the individual. In my communications with investigation groups, we are always able to discern this degree of nuance. It's really just a few loud personalities on the internet, outside of these professional conversations, who tend to get tribalistic or absolutist about this topic. Finally, I'm not married to any hypothesis or idea about hair loss. Kevin Mann's video appears to create this impression that because I've published papers exploring potential anatomical contributors to androgenic alopecia, or because I've published a survey data on scalp massages, then I must only believe in these hypotheses or interventions. That's not true, and it's a really myopic way of thinking about this. The data on Botox were relevant to this part of my discussion with Paul Saladino, but even if data came out refuting the mechanisms suspected from intramuscular injections, it wouldn't matter to me because it wouldn't affect the goals of our website or community, which has always been to help people navigate to effective hair loss interventions built around their needs and preferences. This is why so much of our content focuses on educating people about understanding things like results horizons or how to avoid making treatment decisions that are rooted in cognitive dissonance. It's also why on our weekly live calls, so much time is focused on teaching strategies to improve the tolerability 
or the efficacy of drugs like minoxidil and finasteride, or for individuals who cannot or decide not to use those drugs, what their other options are. I've always found that people's outcomes improve when they have personal guidance or regular check-ins or when they can bounce ideas off others who might have a different expertise or perspective. Kevin Mann is free to disagree, but his presumptions here, like most of the rest of his video, are completely misguided. Next, Kevin Mann asserts that I'm claiming a carnivore diet cures hair loss. Now he's just sucking up to Paul Saladino by claiming the carnivore diet cures graying hair and it can cure hair loss. Kevin Mann actually creates this false impression by cutting out my data qualifiers in the interview and also missummarizing what I really say. Yeah, let's dig into it. Let's, uh, let's go into some of the case studies or some of these slides. In the next portion of the podcast, Paul Saladino and I discuss some of the anecdotes surrounding carnivore diets and hair health. While this might sound out of left field, Paul Saladino's research interests actually revolve around animal-based dieting. In any case, context matters here as it does throughout the entire podcast, and we're now 90 minutes into the podcast before we get to this conversation. I start to talk about some members of our community who had tried finasteride, failed to see hair regrowth, ended up quitting, and then later adopted a carnivore diet for purposes unrelated to hair health, but inadvertently saw what they described as significant improvements to androgenic alopecia. I also showcase other examples of this happening online. I explained to Paul Saladino why these anecdotes really puzzle me, because after all, the general consensus amongst dermatologists, amongst hair loss investigators, is that diet is only supposed to be a negative regulator for hair loss outcomes, which means that a really bad diet is gonna exacerbate inflammation. It's going to lead to nutrient deficiencies. It's going to attack, attack that, that right side of the equation, the hair shedding, that's gonna feed into and accelerate pattern hair loss. But there's no evidence in the clinical literature that a great diet that is nutrient replete, calorie replete, um, and, and meets all of your demands for reducing allergens and inflammation, there's no evidence thus far that that will stop or reverse pattern hair loss. At best, it will only slow its progression. So Paul Saladino and I start to go through these anecdotes and then we segue into a discussion about if we believe these anecdotes to be true, what might be some possible mechanisms to explain the results? Check out the disclaimers that I slap around this part of the conversation. I tend to try to reserve judgment and opinion until we have enough data. And this is one of those topics where we just don't know. It's a hypothesis. It could be completely wrong. Okay, well, this is interesting, but again, this is just another anecdote and I'm gonna reserve judgment until I have more information. When I'm sharing these slides, you have to keep in mind that photo quality varies. People do their best to track progress in our membership with uh, the tools that they have available to them, but there's gonna be slight lighting differences and slight angle differences that can accentuate somebody's degree of hair regrowth and the improvements that they're seeing. Wow, this is really interesting, but you know what? She had had some digestive related distress because she had had some skin problems. I hypothesize that she probably also was dealing with some sort of underlying bout of telogen effluvium and that that was unresolved. So even as I'm talking about these anecdotes, I'm actually doing my best to actively discount their validity. And even when I'm not, I'm qualifying what I'm about to say as being totally speculative. Of course, these parts of the conversation are cut from Kevin Mann's video because, again, I personally feel like Kevin Mann is trying to build a narrative. Only smart people like he and Paul Saladino have figured out that you can avoid it by reducing stress, killing animals. So with all of those qualifiers in the podcast, I then put out the hypothetical and say, if we assume these anecdotes to be true, what might explain these effects? What hypothetical and mechanistic data can we bring to the table that might begin to build a hypothesis. Now, even with all of these massive disclaimers, I knew some people might still misinterpret this segment of the interview and allege that I'm saying a carnivore diet is proven to regrow your hair, or that it's a replacement for finasteride, or maybe they were going to weaponize this discussion for their own agenda. I just knew that this might happen. Although admittedly, I didn't expect it from Kevin Mann because at the time I held him to a higher level of critical thinking. So I even took this a step further. I went into the comments and for any thread heading in this direction, I chimed in to remind everybody that the carnivore diet should not be employed as a first line defense for androgenic alopecia. That we're diving deep into speculative territory here. That I am not endorsing the carnivore diet in any way for the treatment of any hair loss disorder. 
and that people need to seek well-studied treatments. Now, with all of these flashing disclaimers, the caveats, the data qualifications, and even the comments that I left, how does Kevin Mann summarize this section of the podcast? Now he's just sucking up to Paul Saladino by claiming the carnivore diet cures graying hair and it can cure hair loss. It's really easy to do that, but the truth is I never said that. I never used the word cure. It's not my position. It's not what I said. It's not what was featured in the podcast. Unfortunately, we have the full interview to prove it. I really hate that buzzer. Can we not do that? Can clock's say, ticking, clock's ticking. Uh, pass. There is no scientific controlled study that shows any effect of the carnivore diet on hair loss. Kevin Mann is delivering this statement in such a way that you'd think he's disagreeing with me, but he's not. He's just removing my qualifiers, mis-summarizing my positions, and then holding me accountable for his own mis-summaries. Name something people add sugar to. Coffee. Oh, uh, oh, we need answers. Yeah, no, no, okay, uh, no, then pass. Well, guess what? This was one patient selected to represent results of the best of the best responders out of a thousand people. So he is assuming that the researchers here showed the very best example of finasteride's response. That's not necessarily so. Most scientists would show a typical response in their papers. Here, Kevin Mann is claiming that the photo I'm showing on this slide of a finasteride patient probably doesn't represent a best response, it represents a typical response. In this situation, Kevin is actually incorrect. I even left the study reference in the slide, which Kevin could have used to fact check. This photo was taken from one of the biggest studies ever conducted on finasteride for the treatment of androgenic alopecia. And the authors featured this photo to represent one of the best responses over a two year period. They even contextualized this response by featuring other photos classified as moderate improvements rather than top improvements. I know this is just a minor thing, but again, when dozens of minor errors compound over a 62 minute reaction video, they snowball into huge mischaracterization and they can leave a false impression of the actual conversation or the validity of what somebody is talking about. Report a cessation in pattern hair loss, improvements to hair graying, and these are anecdotes that we should not ignore because this is how science begins. Well, it sure doesn't seem to be helping these carnivore YouTubers. In fact, if you look at Primal Edge Health's earlier videos back when he was a vegan still, you can see his hair looks better. So his androgenic alopecia has progressed at a normal rate. But Rob English will probably ignore those anecdotes because they don't fit with his narrative. This is why anecdotes don't belong in a serious scientific discussion. If it isn't already obvious, I'm not pushing a narrative. I'm having a conversation with Paul Saladino that asks the question, if these anecdotes are true, what might explain them? I'm also not dismissing anecdotes of people trying a carnivore diet and not seeing success across hair or health parameters. I even mention my own struggles trying the diet and that not everybody trying this diet reports hair related benefits. Secondly, I wholeheartedly disagree with Kevin Mann about anecdotes. Anecdotes do belong in serious scientific discussions. In fact, they're a pillar for scientific innovation. This is why virtually all of the world's top dermatology journals welcome submissions of anecdotes in the form of case studies. In fact, over the last 70 years, most of our biggest leaps in hair loss research have actually come from anecdotes. How was type 2 5-alpha DHT implicated in androgenic alopecia? From anecdotes about men who lack the type 2 5-alpha reductase enzyme and who also happen to be completely protected from baldness. How did topical minoxidil become a hair loss drug? From anecdotes of people reporting hair regrowth while using the drug orally to lower their blood pressure. How did we discover that scarring alopecias, contrary to what we previously believed, are actually reversible? Because of anecdotes of women regrowing their hair in fully scarred patches, sometimes accidentally by doing things as simple as stopping sunscreen use on their forehead. It's anecdotes like these that inform later phases of research. So to dismiss discussions of anecdotes is to essentially dismiss a huge portion of the scientific process itself. What is important is that anecdotes remain contextualized as anecdotes, not clinical trials which is exactly what I did throughout this podcast. But that's not the impression that Kevin Mann wants to give. We need answers. Yeah, no, no, okay, uh, no, then pass, then okay, pass. Uh, a thing you associate with Charlie Chaplin. Mm, pass. We're getting to the end. Kevin Mann doesn't attempt to explain the hypothesis that I present to Paul Saladino about these anecdotes. Instead, here's how he describes it. Here he starts speculating about the role of gut bacteria. He says gut bacteria has an influence on DHT and androgens. And he goes on and on and on about the gut mycoflora biome. Off of these bacteria that can potentiate the recirculation of DHT and the worsening of certain... 
Even Paul Saladino is getting bored by this rambling bro science bullshit. Kevin then chooses to highlight a small point of disagreement that I had with Paul Saladino regarding gut enzymatic activity of something called beta-glucuronidase. And if we can lower those numbers more effectively through carbohydrate elimination or by improving gut dysbiosis. But I think there's something here. I just want to be careful that we're not too quickly jumping to the conclusion that it's all carbohydrates that are contributing to the problem here. I think that I'm willing to accept that it's dysbiosis and we need to understand where that dysbiosis comes from. I found Paul Saladino's point to be interesting. And in the spirit of discussion, I presented evidence that might bolster his hypothesis. I show a few cases whereby improvements to gut dysbiosis through fecal microbiota transplants, but not carbohydrate elimination, improved hair loss outcomes. And for both alopecia areata, alopecia areata, it's an autoimmune form of hair loss. Again, this is a different type of hair loss disorder. This is alopecia areata, borderlining on alopecia universalis, and androgenic alopecia. This is a very clear cut case of what looks like pattern hair loss. The latter example is what really matters here since the hypothesis centers around androgenic alopecia, DHT recirculation, gut microflora, and then that beta-glucuronidase activity. So, Let's see how Kevin Mann portrays these exchanges. That's taking it a step too far, in my opinion. Uh-oh, poor Rob English is getting absolutely wrecked here. Paul Saladino absolutely tears this kid a new asshole, and all you can do is watch him like a deer in headlights. Kevin Mann then omits the example that I showed to Paul Saladino of a fecal microbiota transplant improving androgenic alopecia and only shows viewers the case reports that I show on alopecia areata. Doing this allows him to make the following claim. Even if there is some merit to any of this, he's talking about alopecia areata, which is an autoimmune disease, which has nothing at all to do with androgenic alopecia. So Rob is just grasping for straws at this point after being totally humiliated by internet tough guy, Dr. Paul Saladino. Again, this is just another example of Kevin Mann trying to drive a completely false narrative that misrepresents the entire conversation. All right, well, I am officially exhausted backfilling all the context that Kevin Mann cuts out and correcting all of his missummaries. And while I enjoy diving into these topics, we are not out of the woods yet. These two gonks, what they're doing is that they're both selling stuff, and they like to give the impression that there's somehow a lot of unknown hair loss treatments out there, and that these unproven so-called natural therapies may be better than FDA clinically proven medications. Again, please refer back to the first half of the podcast centered around confirming finasteride's efficacy and contextualizing its risk of side effects. Also, not to repeat myself, but the study we published on scalp massaging is entirely free. I also mentioned that it was survey-based and that these rank low on the hierarchy of evidence. And this is all evident in our community. Now, I know that it is inevitable at this point that there will be people who will respond to this video by personally attacking me for being too mean and trying to make it out like I'm not trustworthy, but the truth is, I'm not the one who's trying to sell you something. I'm just trying to analyze the studies here and give you the best information that I possibly can. I make these videos for fun. I have nothing to gain financially from you choosing whether or not to follow my advice, unlike Rob English and Paul Saladino, who do stand to gain financially from you falling for their scams. Unless things have changed from earlier this year, Kevin Mann monetizes his channel. Moreover, Kevin Mann does not make himself accessible to people seeking his advice on hair loss outside of his YouTube channel. That means the only way you can choose to follow Kevin Mann's advice is if you can listen to it, which requires you to watch Kevin Mann's content on a platform that Kevin Mann monetizes. To reiterate from earlier, I don't have any issues with this. Again, I think that Kevin Mann works really hard on his channel, and I think that he deserves to be compensated for his efforts. But when Kevin Mann claims that he just makes these videos for fun, it's not necessarily true. Which, again, I don't have any issues with this, so long as somebody is honest about it, and so long as they're not monetizing stuff like this. Why is Rob English even bother trying to save his hair? He doesn't have androgenic alopecia. All right. Let's wrap this up. I think Kevin Mann is an influential voice in the hair loss community. We have different communication styles and at times different interpretations of the literature. Kevin Mann probably feels that discussions about alternative interventions outside of FDA approved drugs do not deserve much attention on podcasts. I feel that in a podcast, so long as data on finasteride are front loaded and accurately represented, and so long as discussions on alternatives are qualified within that context and within a hierarchy of evidence, it's okay to talk about them especially when those interventions are entirely free and accessible to anybody with an internet connection. 
Regardless, these differences in opinion do not give Kevin Mann a green light to misrepresent the real conversation that took place between me and Paul Saladino, nor should they motivate him to broadcast a false narrative about me, my opinions, or even my medical history. France. So there you have it, my one hour response to a one hour reaction video of a two plus hour podcast. I know this was a long one, but I saw this as a great opportunity to dive into hair loss topics that I don't think get a lot of attention on YouTube. So thank you for sticking around. I hope you found the information useful. And while I'd love for Kevin Mann to correct the record on pretty much everything, I don't plan on making any more videos about this because I don't think that Kevin Mann is playing fair. Overriding somebody's medical history, hypercutting an interview, incorrectly defining one of the world's most common hair loss disorders, if not the most common hair loss disorder, misrepresenting exchanges between the guest and the host, misrepresenting data in scientific rebuttals, missummarizing somebody's positions, holding people accountable for views they don't even have. Oh, little mustache, not the answer. little mustache. Oh, oh, answer, so, man. So, He's France. something. All right, I have never seen <laughs> a more embarrassing display in my entire career. <laughs> so for now, I'd like to shift my focus back toward what I actually love doing, which is interacting with investigation groups, reviewing manuscripts, publishing papers, engaging with our community and producing more content. In the meantime, we will be releasing more videos. We've got a big backlog, but I wanted to pause things for a little bit so that we can get this video out first. I hope you enjoy what's coming and thanks for watching.